We are joined in the studio by Harry Hutchinson as we continue this conversation about who is really behind these protests. And as we've said, these names are not shocking, uh, but they are just kind of the proof in the pudding, if you will. Like they are showing when you have a name like a Soros or a Gates or a Rockefeller, it's just uh, at some point hilarious. It is. Uh, And it's important to note that this uh, reflects reporting from Politico, not a conservative magazine. So on one hand, uh, you have these individuals strongly supporting Joe Biden. But on the other hand, you have these individuals supporting groups that support not dissent, but hatred and anti-Semitism, including terrorism and violence. So at Columbia, for instance, uh, they had a um, meeting, um, a virtual meeting with a group called Salmon Down, um, a Palestinian prisoner solidarity network based in Vancouver, British Columbia. This is a group that celebrated the October 7th Hamas attack on Israel. The administration twice barred the event, citing some of the organizers' known support for terrorism and the promotion of violence. Nonetheless, the event went forward. But what is really imperative for listeners to note is that these groups have received funding directly or indirectly from Joe Biden supporters, including the Pritzker family, George Soros, uh, the Rockefeller brothers, and often it, the funding occurs through the use of a foundation. So, for instance, the Tides Foundation or some other group. So the American people should be aware of the fact that Joe Biden's donors effectively are supporting terrorism and effectively celebrating what happened on to- October the 7th, 2023. Harry, you brought up that Samadown uh, organization that... They held a course, Resistance 101, for people planning on these protests at Columbia. And you also noted that twice they were canceled because they were trying to use university facilities to host this group for a Resistance 101. But then they ended up doing it virtual. And one of the quotes that came out of Wall Street Journal's reporting out of this is just shocking. So one of the organizers in this two-hour session, this training session that they held, said... There is nothing wrong with being a member of Hamas, being a leader of Hamas, or being a fighter in Hamas. These are the people that are on the front lines of defending Palestine. So the the question turns, one, this was publicly available that the Wall Street Journal could go find it. Obviously, the administration was aware of this group and should have been monitoring this. But does that even lead a further uh, discussion point about the weakness of the administration when they knew the groups that were training their encampment were proactively encouraging support of a designated terrorist organization and further terror by allowing this to be the training they were receiving? Are you shocked that they didn't take action quicker than we saw? Well, I'm not shocked. Um, And in fact, this is par for the course at many elite universities. Uh, Many elite universities in the United States are basically uh, incredibly weak, particularly at the top. So on one hand, they claim that they support free speech, But then under the cover of free speech, they are effectively supporting terrorism. And I don't think that claim is too strong. And I I think that Congress should take active steps to deprive these institutions of federal funds and perhaps deprive the students of federal loan guarantees. So I think what is needed is a response from the political sphere to the inaction and the weakness, the fecklessness of the administration at campuses throughout the United States. Uh, Just as I was coming down uh, for the show, uh, I looked at footage at the University of California at San Diego. There, the students broke through a barrier. And one of the things that I think it's imperative to remember is that the administrations at many of these universities They do not really support the police in cracking down on the demonstrators. 
they basically are giving lip service to law and order and the protection of property. If you didn't see, uh, Saturday Night Live actually opened this week with a sketch that was pretty funny. Uh, I'll be honest, uh, the Keenan Thompson led about you know, kind of parents' frustrations with their kids protesting. And of course, they spent all of this money, and now they're not even going to get to watch their kids graduate. Uh, hilarious sketch uh, from Saturday Night Live. I know that you usually don't necessarily hear that these days, but I think it shows that there is a a tide turning in this country. They see the the actual kids that are out there uh, are ones being misled by some of these big organizations, by uh, organizations that have been ready for this and have been planning for months. I think we're learning that too, is that right. this wasn't something that just sprung up all of a sudden in a week. Uh, this was an attempt to overthrow these schools uh, and really to, to create a media moment that's been being planned for really since the attacks. Well, and I think when you follow the money, what's interesting is that the Soros, Rockefeller, Pritzker, and Gates uh, triumphant donor pocketbooks, not only are they huge donors to Joe Biden, huge jo- donors to the organizations creating this chaos on campus, but also huge donors to these universities themselves. So their money is touching every facet of this this chaos. And at some point, you have to wonder which angle of their agenda is going to reign supreme. Because if they can start pulling their funding from the universities and continue funding the chaos or pulling their dollars from the presidential candidate, that dollar has a lot of ability to affect change on policy, which is obviously the end goal for these organizations is to affect the policy of President Biden. There's a reason they're calling him Genocide Joe. Do you think that it will come to that? where they're going to hold these universities hostage, not just from encampments, but also with their donations to the universities themselves? I think they will try. It's important to keep in mind that these organizations support a permanent revolution in the United States. They are committed to a leftist agenda. And the leftist agenda, if you go back and you look at history, is committed to a constant revolution and a constant revolution that continues for decades. Um, But keep in mind, once you achieve a revolution, then there's something to revolt against because you are now in charge. And so many of the universities that we are talking about, they are helmed by individuals that have supported a revolution for quite some time. That's how they attain their particular position. So when I taught at law schools uh, in the United States, many of the law professors were revolutionaries. Mm. Yes, they wanted tenure. Yes, they wanted a huge raise. But they wanted to foment a revolution in the United States that ultimately destroys the structure of the country. And this goes back to even 1966. In 1966, two sociologists at Columbia University, ironically enough, Cloward and Piven, they set forth their agenda for radical change, which has continued. They wanted to bring about the collapse of the market system in the United States. They don't really care about middle-income individuals who are having difficulty uh, making payments on their house or their car or or, uh, gasoline. What they care about is a revolution.